where do you want to go from there, Matthew? Well, let's let's tie it all together, right? So if, if it's we've ruled out thermite for sure, we've ruled out nukes, we've ruled out Bin Laden and his cell phone. Mm-hmm. You know, so let's have a talk. With a, there's a, a guy in Canada called John Hutchinson. So let's uh, move on to him and his experiments. And he started what seventies, I think he started doing his experiments. That's right. Now we're sort of taking a slight jump sideways here, but we're going to see, you know, well, we've, got, uh, we've, got, that... we've got we've got like fifteen minutes left, I think, on my clock. Okay. So we... if we can just oh let's yeah, just, yeah, um, yeah. So so let's just <laughs> let people get some like so give them an understanding of what type of energy was used. So it's like give them a. Yeah. A working what, what, theory. We're talk, what we're talking about, we've talked, I've talked already about electrostatic field and a hurricane. Electrostatic energy is like when you stroke your cat and you get a shock off it, or you know, you stop your car at a petrol pump, you touch the petrol pump, you get a spark. What's happened is your car has, has collected electrostatic energy, collected electrons, and then you're discharging when you touch the pump or you touch the roof of your car or the door or whatever. Same around a hurricane, you've got this huge electrostatic field or any thunderstorm. Everyone knows that. I mean, what? That creates lightning for heaven's sake, it's electricity. Everyone knows there is electricity associated with the storm system. We've also talked about the magnetic field. Well, guess what? John Hutchinson, as, as you introduced there, is a Canadian researcher. He has been doing research into using mixing together different forms of energy, such as electrostatic fields from a Van de Graaff generator or from a Tesla coil. And he's been mixing together magnetic fields um, from large magnets and this sort of thing. And he's also mixed together microwave energy using microwave generators. It's called magnetron tubes, if anybody didn't know that. And he, he used radar equipment. And he was he started fiddling around with this because he was trying to reproduce some of uh, Nikola Tesla's experiments and get equipment together. He just He's just a tinkerer. You know, he's not a trained physicist. He hasn't been to university. He hasn't, um, you know, worked in a university laboratory. He's just got an intuitive feel for inventing things, collecting things together. I've spoken to John at length um, because of we have what we haven't had time to cover, but I'll mention it very briefly now. Because we knew that this was correct, a lot of this evidence was submitted to court uh, in a challenge to some of the NIST contractors in 2007, Dr. Wood's court case with the attorney Jerry Leapart. I helped prepare some of the documents uh, for that in, in 2007. I've written a little bit about this in my free book, 9-11 Finding the Truth, which can be downloaded free, and the audio book is free. That's from my website. Everybody who wants to download that, it's all free. Um, so John, and we talk about, I talk about John Hudson in there as well. And um, so he'd been doing these experiments, and what was he creating? Well, guess what? He was creating things like uh, 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 the jellification of metal. So what's jellification of metal another form of? Well, it's another form of molten metal, isn't it? So he was taking a solid uh, bar of aluminium and partly turning it to jelly with his uh, mixing together of electrical energy, microwaves, magnetic fields. He had two tons of equipment to do this, two tons of equipment. Yet the energy to do this was a maximum of 1.5 kilowatts of energy that were used in these experiments. So what's 1.5 kilowatts? Well, a kettle in the UK to boil a cup of tea is three kilowatts of electricity these days, three kilowatts. So he's not using like a huge, massive, you know, he's using a regular wall outlet to power his equipment. He's not using a whole lot of, uh, you know, power station or anything like that. Yet he's he's able to create these jellification effects in metal. He's able to make stainless steel rust. He's able to change one metal into another metal. He's able to levitate things to make them lift off. And fly we out of the air. Yeah, with those cars, uh, we got we touched the cars going rusty and all yeah. toasted, but we didn't actually say some of the cars are turned over, that like upside down and they've been levitated, and we never we never touched on that. We didn't, but, and they're yeah. also on that WTC page, so you know um, we can uh, let's just see if we uh... also people people levitate uh, witness testimony saying I, I, I floated upstairs and similar That's... not quite that but uh, similar. Let's let, let's mention three of them: David Hanscher, the New York Daily News photographer. You Google his testimony, you'll sight see that he was levitated and carried a block as the tower was coming down. We have this famous nine um, eleven sur- surfer. I think his first name is Blaze. Blaise Pasquale, I think it is his name. He didn't come out until about seven or eight years after the events. I think he came out in 2010. And he was on, he says he was on the 26th floor and he felt himself, he felt the building coming apart and he kind of floated down 
to 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 to, to ground London, and he survived. He survived, and he actually became uh, very depressed um, after this. He was one that was levitated, uh, um, and then we've got accounts of uh, a force, a mysterious force going into his bag by René Davila. He talks about that. And another guy who was um, he was lifted off and thrown against the wall. I've got a video clip where he talks about that. And John Hutchinson was essentially creating a levitation, an anti-gravity effect, an anti-gravity effect. This, this is what needs to be covered up at all costs. And guess what? By talking about bombs, nukes, just about anything, you can cover that stuff up really easily. And we've been talking about this since uh, 2008. So we're now getting on for seven years after we started talking about it. And still, hardly anybody knows about it. Uh, people know about 9-11 and all this stuff, but they don't know about Hurricane Arian. They don't know about John Hutchison. They don't know any of this because no. the truth movement has covered it up. And that's what my book is about. Let's, uh, let's just go back... The... Oh, uh, as Dr. Julie Wood says, the, the people who behind 9-11, they've put so much effort into doing the event, do you think they forgot a cover story? Correct, correct. Do you forget, think they forgot to plan a cover-up? The cover-up is even more criminal, I would argue, than the event itself, because of what is allowed to happen. You know, this is what we would argue. So, and I've written to David Ray Griffin, the author, I've written to him, I think, twice now, to say that he is guilty of attempting to pervert the course of justice because he will not talk about what we've been talking about. He's written, five, I think, five or maybe six books about 9-11. You will not find John Hutchison's name mentioned anywhere in any of those five books, despite him submitting a court affidavit in a 9-11-related court case in 2007, which is on Dr. Wood's website, should anybody want to read it. I think before we uh, get to the end, Matthew, I'd like to talk about going into the other side of the energy connection, our friend and uh, Mr. Jones. Shall we talk about that? Well, one sec. Before, before, we start, before we get to uh, John Hutchinson, the military are completely aware of his work, having confiscated his work twice and getting him to work with the military, uh, I think on two occasions. So that, Maybe I'm wrong. So yeah, the, no, the, the Canadian so military take all of you know, yeah, well, just, I, just, I was going to briefly say, it's not just he's, he's, in, his, he's in his own house building these things. The, the military are aware of his work, and they confiscated it, I think it were in... Um, 1990. 1990, yeah. but they did it twice. They, they, twice they've took, they took all his yeah. equipment, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, so, I uh, think, the, the, yeah, that was later they did it as well, in 2008, I think it was, he had some happen. Yeah, I don't think it was all confiscated. I'm not unfamiliar with him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, but the main... I just to bring that up, so, uh, yeah, if yeah. you want to move on to Justin Jones... Well, well, we'll, we'll, we'll just dra sort of tie into what you just said there, because Colonel John Alexander, who people can look up, he talks about UFOs and stuff like that and other stuff, he worked with John Hutchinson in 1983, and he observed and documented some of the effects, you know, the jellification of metal, which at that time when John was doing it, he couldn't reproduce it reliably. He's been able to reproduce it since. Um... John Hutchinson worked with John Alexander for four months doing these experiments. And at that time, uh, John Alexander, Colonel John Alexander, head of the non-lethal weapons program, or he became that uh, for, for a period of time, he was working for Los Alamos National Laboratories, Los Alamos National Laboratories, which if people don't know, that's where the atomic bomb was developed in the 1940s. Right? So we're not in good shape. We're not in good shape with this sort of uh, uh, these sorts of connections. Now, John wasn't. John was being investigated for by them. He wasn't kind of trying to do things for them. But that, from what John told us, John Hudson, that is, they already knew what he was doing. They already knew the effects that he was going to create and the way that they were going to unfold based on what setup he had. So they were familiar with this technology in 1983. Now let's talk about another thing to try and dispel another myth. It is claimed that Dr. Judy Wood doesn't talk about the evidence of nuclear effects at the World Trade Center, um, such as the cancer that, was, uh, that victims have suffered, which the nukers would claim is caused by the radiation. Well, <clears throat> there wasn't a substantial amount of nuclear radiation at the World Trade Center site. And Could you can take a gap... Some of it will be just the poisonous uh, kind of toxic cocktail of dust, dustified steel, dustified computers, 
justified. There was a little bit of asbestos as well, but that was actually um, st they stopped using that halfway through the construction, I think, of one of the towers. Um, but the thing that people need to understand, another of the key indicators that was found at the World Trade Center, which the nukers latch onto, is tritium. Tritium is a form of hydrogen. It's actually an isotope of hydrogen. It has, a, I understand, one or two extra neutrons in the nucleus, and I can't remember uh, how many. But um, This was found about 50 times the normal level in water at the World Trade Center site. This was done with a, a, a Thomas Cahill study, I think. People have tried to claim that this proves that it was a nuclear bomb that went off because that's what happened. And that is true. You do get tritium uh, when a nuclear bomb goes off. However, is the it, amount of tritium the created... Way? No, that's one of them. Yeah, it's, it, 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 it's the only... Um, how can I put it? The mainstream physicists will tell you it's the only way you can get tritium is from a nuclear reaction, rather from a... a you know, a nuclear bomb going off. But um, there is another place, going back a few years now, where tritium was found to be being produced. And it was in experiments which were done in the late 1980s, early 1990s, in something called cold fusion. Cold fusion. That's not a good name for it. It should really be called low-energy nuclear reactions. People who go... Yes, indeed. We'll get on to that. Shall we? Just in a few closing minutes.